interests, local elite, local strongmen, sometimes even the local mafia. And there are examples, too many examples, from say the US South, from the Sicilian towns in Italy, from the uh, villages in North India. I could give you many examples of local capture. So that's something that we have to be, uh, keep in mind. As a result, we have to worry about reform of the local democratic process, uh, re police reform even, and also uh, local public finance reform, uh, particularly local property taxation reform. So that's my first point. Second point I want to talk about is that, and this is partly going to the area of what the book that Manush referred to, in my book, I, I, I sometimes have talked about the issue of democratic uh, disenchantment, as, as in the title. And there, I think it's very important to emphasize that quite often, certainly in the Washington consensus, which, uh, which focused on uh, market uh, importance of the market, uh, even critical of that discussion, quite often focuses on the state and centralized state more than the decentralized state. But I want to emphasize that between the state and the market or the state and the citizen, there's a whole layer of intermediate institutions. What do I have in mind? Uh, trade unions, works councils, neighborhood associations, PTAs, parent teacher associations in rural context, uh, irrigation water user associations, uh, foreign forest management committees. So these are examples of intermediate institutions which often get neglected. We concentrate on the state and the citizen or the state and the market. And to me, those are important not merely for enriching democracy, but also have they have positive economic effects. Just to give you an example, I, gave, uh, I was talking about the trade unions. If you look at the German works councils literature, now there's observational data as well as experimental data to show that when you, works councils are important as they are in Germany, the workers have a voice which affect the, how uh, the productivity is improved. So being labor friendly is not necessarily at the expense of profits. So you can have labor-friendly capitalism if you want. And that improved pro productivity and profits, and I just want to emphasize the positive economic effects of improving the voice of workers, but that's just an example of the governance at the intermediate level. My third bullet point is that because of the erosion of democracy in large parts of the world, people are think of, thinking of alternative political institutions because trust in representative government has declined. Institutions of representative government have declined. So the many proposals now, one proposal is about uh, a second chamber in the legislature, which will be, in fact, some people say it should be drawn as a lottery, and then uh, they, they will have hearings from experts, there will be discussion on many important issues. Uh, there have been examples of citizens' assemblies where Controversial issues have been resolved. Uh, I also know about digital democracy in Iceland, Estonia, and Taiwan. My fourth point, uh, it will be briefer than the first three points necessarily. Uh, I think everybody is very worried about the toxic influence often of social media, and particularly people are talking about how to regulate the big tech companies but one has to keep in mind, in regulating the big tech companies, uh, often the countervailing power is given to the state. But we have to keep in mind, unlike uh, countries like these, a large part of the world population now live under authoritarian or semi-authoritarian countries. And in that context, taking the power away from tech companies, giving it to the state, essentially it will give the state the power to do the surveillance and repression of dissent. So you have to keep in mind, there are also local institutions. Let me give you just one example. The city of Barcelona have arranged for a civic data trust. How local 
community go to manage the data which is tech companies take from them, extract from them. My last point. Uh, last point is, uh, is, and in my book I talk, uh, the, my last chapter is quite a bit on that. Today we can, we, all of us can think of many issues of uh, where increased international coordination uh, are need, is needed. But this is also at a time when uh, dark geopolitical tension clouds are in the horizon. So how do you do that? And I think that's where we have to think creatively and also work with diligence to while the geopolitical threats remain, will remain, going back to the old Cold War days when much of my youth was spent, it is still possible to work out some agreements, even between hostile powers, to which will serve the international community. Those are my five bullet points. Thank you. Pranab, it's very unfair to ask you to summarize a whole book in eight minutes, but <laughs> there you have it. And now I'll ask Diane to do the same. Thank, thank you so much. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to sit here because I'll vanish behind the, uh, the podium. Um, so one of the questions about why we might want a new consensus is why we might want a new consensus. And one answer might be that things aren't going so well at the moment. But another answer that I want to talk about is the two massive technological transformations that are underway globally. And we have this concept in economics of general purpose technologies, the technologies that not only transform their own industries, but the whole of the economy and the way society is organized. And they are typically energy and communications technologies. And we have both of those going on at the same time. The energy transition is really urgent because since at least the Second World War, probably much longer, we've been using nature for free in the economy. Um, but now, unlike in the second world, post-Second World War era, when physical capital was scarce, when human capital was scarce, uh, it's now natural capital that is becoming scarce, and its marginal cost is becoming very high. So that's the binding constraint on economic growth. We haven't been paying for it. We have to pay for it. We're poorer than we think we are. And that's really urgent. So that's all I want to say about that, because I don't want to trespass on Nick's territory too much. So there's the energy transition. Uh, from fossil fuels to renewables. There's also the digital transition. And you might ask, well, do we really need that one? Um, after all, social media, misinformation, all of those bad things. Um, but information is almost free at the margin. It's now the, the um, resource that's abundant. And there is a time trice. You've got to pay attention to make sense of it. But there's an app for that. The new AI chatbots are helping economize on the time that you need to use the technologies. And we need to use that to substitute for our use of nature and physical resources. And actually, that's been happening for a long time. My first book came out in 1996, soon after the World Wide Web was invented. It was called The Weightless World. And the central image was that the material footprint of the economy was not getting larger whereas GDP carried on increasing substantially. So the value we're creating in economies, on average, is intangible value, it's information value. Information has always been the fuel of progress. It's people having ideas about how to use the resources we have um, in different ways to create things of value. And that doesn't mean more cars, more pairs of shoes, it means better health, the higher quality of life, all of those ideas that drive innovation. So there's great potential in digital, um, both to economize on resource use, also to improve the quality of lives and health outcomes, if we can figure out how to do it. And the trouble is that transformations like this are never very smooth, because there are winners and losers, and there's contestation about how to do things, and legislation and regulation are slow to keep up. But these transformations always go much better if the benefits are widely shared. And that's not what's happening at the moment. We have seen, um, uh, since the 1980s, an increase in inequality, which we discussed in the conference today. Um, and the median has stopped improving. The middle class has stopped seeing things getting better, which is a complete change from the earlier period of capitalism. And there's this footloose plutocracy uh, um, that doesn't seem very connected 
to their own societies. And so we're seeing some of the political ramifications of that, the impact on, on, on representative democracies. So the fundamentals of the economy are becoming profoundly different from the ones that shaped the Washington Consensus. But this is where you reach for your Gramsci, and I'll get the quote a bit wrong, but the old is dying and the new is still struggling to be born. There are lots of areas of consensus about policy, but it's not a worldview in the same way as the Washington Consensus was. And I think that's, that's our challenge. So we want somebody to have political vision, we want some good economic strategies, but we're not quite sure um, what the new order is going to look like. But I think a few things are clear, and um, these are my final points. One thing is that the collective outcome is not the same as the sum of individual outcomes. The old economic model focused on individuals and adding them up and looking at averages. I think we've become much more aware of externalities, spillovers, the way that social norms affect behavior, the way that we need to think about collective outcomes as um, a thing in themselves, not just what happens to individuals added up or averaged. A second point is that we need to think about non-linearities. Um, and that might be that soil quality is degrading, so year by year the yields go down, but at some point the degradation of the soil quality goes so far that you lose almost all the agricultural productivity. There are lots of tipping points around biodiversity and climate and um, we're not entirely clear both um, where they're going to happen and what the impacts of those are going to be on fundamental things like food supplies. It could be digital markets, which have uh, extreme uh, in, uh, returns to scale and non-linearities, so they tip often to having one dominant player. Um, to encourage consistent innovation and competition in markets, we need to have some sense of what those tipping points are. And do we care as policymakers what the identity of the dominant player in a digital market is? So there are lots of questions and lots of um, economic policies. Or it might be non-linearities in supply chains. We've seen those seizing up unexpectedly. There's a lot of work going on to think about how production operates in networks of complex supply chains. Um, but having a clear idea about where those vulnerabilities are and the resilience of the economy. So think about the non-linearities and the tipping points. And then finally, and this is echoing um, the point that we just heard about the role of the intermediate institutions, distinguishing between markets and state, I think, is a dangerous distinction to make. Because the challenges that we're facing are coordination problems. And thinking that either markets or state or any other kind of institution could fix those by themselves is, is um, going to end in failure. Because market failures, government failures, institutional failures are pervasive because these are complex linked challenges where we need to think of system solutions and so let's think instead about how do we collectively organize our economies and society to get the best use of the resources that we have and share the benefits as widely as possible so thank you thank you Doug. So London consensus, London's a really good word. I'm one of the very few LSE professors who born and brought up in London. <laughs> consensus troubles me a bit. But to get things done, we have to agree on some things. But consensus sort of is like agreement on everything, and that <laughs> offends my anarchic spirit, and I hope it offends yours as well. Um, I want to look back and I want to look forward. Manoush, can you, to, after four, maybe five minutes, uh, tell me to start looking forward? But we have, to look, we have to look back. I mean, market fundamentalism was with us in the 1980s. We lived it. It wasn't very nice, and I'll come back and describe that in just a minute. But um, the Washington Consensus was declared in 1989. We'd been living market fundamentalism. And uh, that is something that we have to recognize. There's an overlap between the Washington Consensus and market fundamentalism. But in a sense, market fundamentalism took over first. Um, but they've come to be uh, probably too close uh, 
wonderfully uh, wound together. And John Williamson, who was a friend and colleague at the University of, of Warwick uh, in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, actually was quite distressed by the way in which they had been uh, brought, brought together. Um, so this was an age, and, and I think the, the, there's no exact translation, but in French, it, it's a liberalism, liberalism triomphant. It was that kind of atmospherics that we, uh, that we were dealing with. And of course, Francis Fukuyama had um, the end of history and the, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89. But remember, it was the 80s before this was articulated in the way that John Williamson uh, set out that we had to uh, live through. And it's important in trying to understand the 80s that we look back at the 70s. And the, um, the, you know, the, the, of course, there were the, the oil, oil crises and the miners, the miners' strikes, the winter of discontent and the unburied uh, bodies that eventually got Mrs. Thatcher uh, and the Tory party elected. There was a reaction at that time to the way in which the state had grown after the Second World War. Um, building very good things like the welfare state and education and health and so on that matter so much. And of course it was at the heart of what Lyndon Johnson saw as the um, great society. So whilst we can un <clears throat> understand the reaction to the strife of the 70s and the growth of the role of the state, much of that reaction was sweeping, analytic, un 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 unanalytical, at times uh, vicious, and often misguided. Now, I have um, a charge sheet, and I'll put this up on not on the screen, but perhaps on the uh, on the, the website. In the 80s, we saw improved productivity, better market functioning, and stronger entrepreneurship. Positives, yeah. But my goodness, the negatives were immense, and we have to remind ourselves because we remind ourselves what's wrong with market fundamentalism. Unemployment. Uh, was over 10% for much of the 1980s, having been around 5% for much of the 1970s. We squandered most of the profits of the North, of North Sea Oil on the unwanted leisure of the unemployed. The Gini coefficient in that time it jumped from 0.24 to 0.35, immense. The ratio of the, the 90th percentile to the 10th percentile um, went up from around 3 to 5. I mean, this was an enormous increase in inequality, which we've never actually put right over, over time. The, the, the Royal Commission on Distribution of Income and Wealth was abolished in 79. You weren't supposed to notice too heavily what was uh, going on. We were told that there's no such thing as uh, society, and it fostered a really aggressive, self-centred view of morality and behaviour. We... Public services were denigrated. Town planning and our city pride were undermined. Public transport was belittled. The sale of council houses took place at around 40% or so discount on value, mostly went to the wealthier uh, of um, our council house tenants and eviscerated social housing for the subsequent future with all the problems that we, we faced now. And, of course, the huge social strife around the miners' strike of the 1980s, which tore, in many ways, the spirit and community spirit apart right across the country. Financial, financial asset sales. Some of the privatisation made sense. It really did. But, you know, read um, what Jonathan Portis had to say last year in The Guardian. I worked in the privatisation of water, he said, and quotes, it was an organised rip-off. And if you look at the vast profit, those assets are given away. Is that more or less four? OK, all right. Um, so the big, the big bang in 1986 led to uh, sow the seeds of the financial crisis. The AN, foreign policy ANC was described as a typical terrorist organisation. Uh, Pinochet described as a long-standing friend of Britain, and the arms embargo was abolished, uh, lifted, almost as soon as that uh, government took over, and of course the unification of Germany was uh, opposed. Apart from that, it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah? And we have to remember what the consequences really were. The reaction was building during the uh, 1990s, um, and it wasn't a consensus. I mean, I, I can document, I, sp I tried to speak up in articles and speeches. Our dear, dear friend Tony Atkinson said uh, his piece, Joe Stiglitz said his piece, we didn't do very well. It was drowned out 
and uh, that was what uh, um, we have to now live with. So looking forward, um, well, let, let me rem remind you what we actually did miss out. I mean, we missed out market failure, profound market failures. We missed out inequality and social cohesion. We missed out during that period the idea of what directional change uh, could be. It was profoundly unstrategic. Look at the way in which uh, uh, East Asian tigers grew. Now, that was much more strategic approach to, uh, to, to building, building markets and so on. So that was the uh, legacy, and as I say, I've set it out in a bit more detail uh, on paper, which I'll, which I'll put up. But those were the things we missed out. It was, you know, the failures, the inequality, the social cohesion, the sense of the the, the sense of um, the sense of, of direction. It was very, very unstrategic. Now, if we look forward, we have to be strategic because this decade is absolutely decisive for climate and biodiversity and sustainable development. We risk not only a lost decade for development, we risk through inaction and weakness. A, uh, uh, a decade which will essentially undermine the prospects for future development over almost indefinite future. Those are the stakes for which we're playing. Actually, we know what to do. We have to make profound uh, structural change in our energy and transport and cities and land and water. We have to invest a lot to get there, and it has to be an investment of the kind actually we largely understand. But it's not get the prices right and let investment fall where it may. It's actually a clear directional change that we understand and that we have to do. And you don't redesign a city through a carbon price. I'm a great advocate of the carbon price, don't get me wrong, but you cannot do that simply by a uh, so-called getting the prices right. You've got fundamental market failures here which you have to tackle at the same time as you're promoting this dynamic structural change. Six, and we run through them, greenhouse gases, R&D, capital markets, networks, and lots of networks here important, whether it's public transport or grids or, or internets and, and so on. Information, we have to understand what it is in what we're buying. We have to understand our technological opportunities. And there are many co-benefits in this, in this transformation, which are not simply climate, like stopping poisoning the air. You know, we kill somewhere between five and ten uh, million people a year worldwide through air pollution. Most of it, not all of it, but most of it comes from burning of fossil fuels. And those are immediate benefits beyond, of course, the story of climate. Those are six key market failures, and we have to act on them all. I haven't got time to go into how we act on them all, but just take the capital market failures. This is a story where we have to take long-term risk and we have to finance long-term projects, and we know the capital markets are not particularly good at doing that. There are answers. The development banks will be of fundamental importance, and particularly the multilateral development banks. In work I've done with Vera Songwe and Amar Bhattacharya, we work out that given the investments that we need and given the potential for internal financing of the investments, emerging markets and developing economies um, would need inflows of about a trillion dollars a year by 2030, and, by, uh, and that simply couldn't happen without uh, multilateral development banks uh, at least tripling the financing in the next uh, five years. So that's the story. We can see what we have to do, and it's actually we have to put in those things which we didn't put in in the, uh, in the 1980s. You know, it, it's about market failures. It's about inequality. It's about structural change. It's about innovation. And that's where we have to uh, focus our policy. If we produce a London consensus which allows us to deliver on that, then we'll really have done something of value. If we fail, then our legacy will be catastrophic. So thank you. Yeah. All right, so uh, have some slides. Um, such a pleasure to be here. Um, for me, what uh, Washington consensus missed, 
that we risk uh, to miss again. It's the central role of political distortion and the historical roots of political distortion. So um, I'm going to give you, uh, I want to start with some personal uh, intellectual history here. So this is a picture of me in uh, college. It's on the far left. The heart is, hasn't changed. Um, but I was a, first I was a hardcore far left um, political activist trying to do something about political distortion. Now, as soon as I had the opportunity to get into grad school, guess what? The first thing that came to my mind is to study political mechanism in economic development. So I was lucky enough to get a job um, at Yale University, and then I came across this quote by Kant. That really changed uh, my trajectory completely. He said that, I mean, roughly, good government can be created by devils, so long as they have intelligence. So what, what you do is to establish for institutions so that even if they are private disposition, might be antagonistic, they can act as if they have no evil sentiments. We have to find a solution for that problem. So it gets me to think of political economy as a solution, political economy as an exercise to design, implement institutions to solve social and political distortion. So, and later on, it became clear to me that of the centrality of institutions, of political institution in development debate. Because, you know, now, uh, we focus on productivity gaps uh, being driven by disparity in capital and labor. But then, according to recent studies, it accounts only, it account at most for 50% in differences in income per capita. So what is key, the key gap, the key to explain the gap between the rich and poor countries is the difference in total factor productivity, which is, in short, the social infrastructure of development. You know, like social cohesion, uh, political institutions, and so on. And so, and government play a key role, a fundamental role through its policies, institutions, in trying to resolve political distortion and get us close to the first best, you know? So when we think about, you know, innovation, education, capital accumulation, those are measures of growth. And those measures are driven by political institutions. And, and government through state capacity and institutions basically uh, help, uh, you know, uh, to do that. And by, by what, what we mean by institutions, it's simply the mechanism for selection of office holders, uh, the many of policy decisions that they could make, and the logic of enforcement of those policies. So institutions have distributed consequences. So the distributed policy that we have discussed are political. And, and also um, the allocation of power of decision making is also critical uh, for policy making as well. So now, what is missing as well is history. You know, I, I, I did a study, um, you know, that shows that the gap between Africa and the rest of the world, if you look at that gap, 72% of it can be explained by slave trade. Silk trade alone account for 72 percent of the gap between Africa and the rest of the world, and account for 99 percent of the gap between Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So Africa would not have been what it is today. I mean, would not have been the poorest continent in the world if not for slave trade. So you cannot 
you cannot ignore history, you know. And for instance, uh, infrastructure today in Africa is, uh, is driven in large part by colonial road network. So, so I'm not preaching historical determinism because if you look closely, um, the literature itself shows that there is no such thing as historical determinism. Because my paper, for instance, shows that, well, slavery affects underdevelopment in Africa through trust. But it only accounts for 15 to 25% of variation in trust level. You know, as Simone and Robinson show historical conditions at plain current institution, it only less at, at most 50%. So history is not destiny. You know, you can shape history through political institutions. So now the question that we need to do for the new consensus, if any, is not to ask whether institutions affect growth, but we need to examine the type of institutions that will be most effective in uh, generating growth, how they can be implemented, and the role of institutional experimentation, decentralization, policy deliberation, and so on. Let me give you a very quick anecdote. You know, two minutes. OK, I'm done. So basically, uh, I did an exercise in Benin, my home country, like four years ago. And corruption is rampant in local governments. And there is an audit report every year. So what I did was I said, OK, let me do, let's do this. So I'm going to assign randomly some municipalities to an institution that consists of the staff in the exclusion of the mayor deliberating over the audit report. Closed door meeting between staff to debate or to discuss what's wrong with the municipality. And the, the status quo is in a situation where the mayor read the audit report and assign blames, fire or hire new people, or, and so on and so forth. This led to a significant, in, this institution led to a significant improve in performance, despite the fact that in the short run, the short term, trust level between staff members declined. So who could imagine that a staff meeting, a closed door staff meeting, for instance, can be a solution for corruption at local level? You know, so this kind of imagination, this kind of experimentation as something that can be critical in generating good governance and, and, and so on. So um, I, 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 I'm going to come back to what I said earlier. What we should be doing more is to think of what politics ought to be and what politics is, measure the gap, and imagine solutions to reduce the gap. And keeping in mind Kant's advice earlier to say that ideas and incentives are key. There's no, we shouldn't be looking for good or bad, evil or whatever politician. It's about creating a system so that they will act as if they have public interests at heart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the entire panel for doing such a wonderful job of raising these huge issues and, uh, and, uh, and keeping to time. Um, let me start with a, a, a sort of more general question for any of you who want to answer and then I'll turn to the audience while you gather your thoughts. You've identified a whole array of things that the Washington Consensus failed to focus on, whether it's political power and the level of, you know, the distribution, distributional issues, technology, market failures, climate, the importance of institutions. And so what I want to ask you is, is what we need to replace it with a sort of new and improved, more complicated Washington consensus with not a list of, I think it was 10 principles in the original Williamson article on the Washington consensus, but with 20 that involve more factors that we need to take into account? Or is the future a more anarchic one of there is no consensus, there is no model, everyone has to find their own way? Or is it 
some genuinely new paradigm uh, for the way we think about economic policy. What, what do you think we need to replace the Washington Consensus with? Who would like to? Nick? Um, I don't think we should look at, um, instead of John Williamson's list of 10, some other list of 10 or a, a dozen. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. But what we should do is understand the problems that we have and think about how we tackle them. And then it seems to me um, there are uh, real possibilities of getting agreement about what has gone wrong and about what we have to do. Not full agreement, consensus is too strong, but enough agreement, and to set out the policies that are necessary to tackle them. I, I tried to zip through some of them um, quickly. But that's not, as it were, to replace one consensus by another consensus. It's to understand where we are, how we got here, what has gone wrong, where we have to go, and the kinds of policies that can help us get there. And one thing that really, really worries me, and I, I, I did emphasize it, but let me emphasize it again, is that we're in a hurry. You know, institutional change takes time. Yeah? That doesn't mean we don't do it, but it means that we have to get on with it and make things happen very quickly. This decade is absolutely decisive. We have to change our systems very quickly. And in order to do that, we have to have some agreement and some understanding about where we need to go and what's gone wrong. But to call that a new something consensus worries me a bit. You have to have a sense of purpose and understanding of what to do. And you have to recognize not only that we're in deep trouble if we don't, but the new approach is cities where we can move and breathe. It's ecosystems which are robust and fruitful. It's much less waste, much more efficiency. Efficiency is productivity, is, uh, is growth. It's much better health. Bad health kills people, bad for growth. I mean, it's a, a much more attractive approach to growth and development. I'm not talking about growth forever, I'm talking about the next 15 or 20 years. A much more attractive to growth and development than uh, we've seen in the past. With a very different set of measures, and Diane and some of us have emphasized this very strongly, a very different set of measures uh, from, uh, of, of success and what it means. So it's finding a principled, clear way forward which tackles the problems and which enough people can get behind. Just, I would just add, I think it is about a different way of thinking about the problems that we face. Nick emphasised that the original Washington consensus was a reaction to earlier problems and crises, and it was a crystallisation of the way that people came to think about addressing those problems. We've got a completely different set of problems and crises, more complicated, interconnected, and, and urgent, as Nick says. So I think it's really about crystallising enough agreement about what's the way to think about tackling these problems, rather than here's a list of 10 or here's a list of 200. All right. Let me... Uh, uh, I guess one line. Um, endorsing both those interventions, I just want to add that quite often we know, even if we know what is to be done, things don't get done. To understand why don't things get done, even if most of us not a consensus. Most of us know what should be done. I think we should, and that's where institutions, governments, political distortions become very important. They do. That's true. Why, can't, why don't we have a carbon tax? Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, Leonard. No, thank you. So, um, I think uh, one of the. I think it's on there. Yeah, okay. So, one of the kind of. Uh, uh, one of the issues with, with original consensus is it's a lot on what, not on how. It's not enough about mobilizing agency. You don't like, it's about we do this for them, this is what they should be doing, instead of thinking creatively about how this could be, yeah. you know. So, and, and also the, the second point uh, is that it, it's, the context matter, and knowing the context is also knowing the local history. You know, for instance, knowing where they are coming from. And, and, and also build on what they're already doing for themselves. You know, and, and it's very important. Look, for instance, I mean, everything that has been said to, to, uh, today, I mean, it was fantastic. 
But then sometimes I hear that this is what the developing countries, uh, this, is, this is what the developing countries will be doing or should be doing. It was no. So it's about creating a world in which they feel responsible for their, their own development and to see to what extent we can make it easier as opposed to harder for them to make those decisions. So I think everything we can come up with here is great, it's important. We learn about we learn from the failure of the past, all this is great. But then we need to think about the how to do it. We also need to think hard about agency so that people can leverage their own their own energy, their own determination to solve their problems and as a result together then we can make Things much better. Yeah, I think getting on with it helps build institutions, and helping build institutions helps us get on with it. But we have to do both at the same time. Yeah. All right. Let me turn to the audience now. If you could uh, just introduce yourself very briefly, uh, that would be great. We'll take uh, this gentleman here, we'll take Danny, and and. Thank you. My name is Michael Joffe. I'm from Imperial College. And uh, I found the presentations really interesting. I want to pick up something a number of the panelists said, but as Lord Stern said, a principled way forward, directional change. Um, there's two aspects. This is the environmental crisis, and I think all people of goodwill who've been following what's going on know there's an environmental crisis, want it to be tackled, want more to be done. I want to talk about the second one briefly, which is, what about the people? What about us humans? And so I, it's about replacing GDP, not for all purposes, because GDP is pretty good at what it does for economic management, needs some tweaking, that's, that's another story. Replacing GDP is a criterion of economic success. I want to suggest that we can do that by instead monitoring basic needs where the basic needs are met. And there's a list of basic needs. Um, it's widely agreed. It's implicit in things like the Sustainable Development Goals and all international agreements. It's, in, it's backed up by survey evidence and even experimental political science evidence and so on. So why don't we prioritize everybody's basic needs being set. Okay, thank you. And Very that clear. would, can I just finish, that would have implications for health, it's the social determinants of health, it would have implications for happiness, where there's a lot of good work goes on in this institution, and that's my suggestion. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, in the back. Hi, my name is Danny, I'm a staff at the MSE. And I uh, wonder, since the original article was 1989, I wonder if the panel might look at the consensus, the Washington consensus, as less a collection of policies and maybe more as, uh, a, 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 through the lens of power projection, great power projection at a time when there was no great power competition in 1989. It's a very different world than the one we live in now. We have, of course, a Chinese model political economy. President of France is dying for there to be a European model of uh, political economy that can be enforced through softer hard power. And we have the resurgence of kind of a non-aligned movement of people, nations that don't want any consensus imposed upon them from any direction. So if we could look at it in that lens, maybe we'd see something very different. Okay, thank you, Danny. And Hi, um, my name's Henrietta Lynch. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, or firstly uh, say that the COP uh, processes use a consensus model to, to find some sort of consensus. But we have a problem with uh, governments agreeing to, uh, or sign up to these things, um, but then almost immediately, for instance, our UK government uh, agreeing to do things which are completely anti what they actually agreed to in the first place. For example, new oil and gas licenses in the North Sea, etc. What mechanisms, I mean, the, the positive side is the consensus of a COP process, but we need mechanisms to uh, work across 
global consensus is to um, deal with people who agree but then backtrack on their agreements. So what's the enforcement mechanism? In some yeah, sense? that's much better. Put. Yeah. Very good. Who would like to start with the alternatives to GDP? Uh, I would like to start with that. <laughs> um, so I have good news on the GDP front. I think there's really widespread recognition that it has been taken to uses um, that are not appropriate, that it's not a good measure of sustainable progress. And the process led by the United Nations for revising official statistics, when that revision is published in a couple of years' time, will have much more environmental measurement, much more measurement of human health, uh, and um, all of the things that speak to your point about, about basic needs. So I think that's widely recognized. And um, it may be, you know, may, may be much slower than, than you would have liked, but I think we are getting to a different set of metrics. They're not so much about how much are needs satisfied, but they are about what's available for people around the world to um, get on and achieve the um, sustainable livelihoods that they would like to. So that's what's going to be much easier to measure. It won't be perfect, a lot of work to do, a lot of statistics to collect, particularly data to collect, particularly on the environment. But I think there has actually been real progress there since I started writing about this 10 years ago. I'm going to ask Leonard and Pranav to ask, take the question on yeah. was the consensus a reflection of the geopolitics at the time and has that changed? And then Nick to do the call question. So, um, uh, very quickly, so I think that um, it's already happening, you know, that we are taking into consideration welfare, and, um, and I think besides all the measures that we know, I think um, something which is maybe less tangible, which is set of empowerment of ownership, that is also super important. You know, I've, I've, through my work, I've heard people who intrinsically value being listened to, show that they matter. So um, that's one thing. The second thing is that um, we also have to find out how individuals in Africa, for instance, deal with those issues. You know, like, okay, my hometown, you know, my cotton is pretty poor, but I haven't seen many people on the streets. I haven't seen, seen many homeless people. You know, and you know, I, when, I, when growing up, I cannot, I'm not, I'm, I'm not making this up. I, not, I cannot imagine anyone that I know who took his life. <laughs> and this is because when you get out of, you get out of your, your house, you see somebody distressed, it becomes your problem. You talk to that person, and even until today, I make sure that I pay the medical bill for everyone in my family. Thank God I could afford it, you know, still. But people will tell me, ah, this is, this is taxing success. But because in the local culture, we value making sure that nobody, if you can, if you are connected to somebody who has a minimum level of income, nobody around you dies of hunger, period. So, you know, we need to design policies that enhance, that enhance this culture as opposed to think that this is backward. This is something that Europe used to do in the 17th century, not anymore. So the point I wanted to make is that happiness, those measures that we talk about, is not, it doesn't have to be government policy. It could be policy that communities, individuals put in place, and then government come in to encourage, to enhance that. You know? So I, I agree with the idea that GDP is not enough. And I think we're already moving in, the, in, a, in, a, in a great direction in that, at least, at least in many, many developing countries. But I think it's about thinking about policy uh, to, to enhance that, uh, not necessarily through top down, but also bottom up. Going back to the geopolitical question, I, I happened to be quite uh, active at, at, at that time, and I was in Washington, in the World Bank, seriously criticizing them for the so-called consensus. But in terms of geopolitics, I, yes, there is a difference. The rival superpower is now different. But there's not a great deal of change, except that meanwhile, 
the continuing superpower has also been discredited in many ways. And also the itself, there is self-reflection. Since I live in the United States, I see this self-reflection going on. Sometimes attempts at correction, which may not be always, uh, always be to the extent that you want or, uh, or maybe too much. Take the case of industrial policy. Now one of the major advocates of industrial policy is the United States, who used to tell the other countries how good markets are, free trade, etc. Now in the United States is trying to give leadership on industrial policy. I used to advocate industrial policy in the 1980s. <coughs> Everybody's telling me you should do it by market. Uh, but I think one needs some a balance. Um, the other thing that's happening, the other thing that I wanted to point out, the non-aligned countries, by the way, was very large even then. I mean, there are a large number of non-aligned countries, my country, India, being one of them, uh, in which they said, no, we are not going to go with either camps. And that is now, you see, uh, in, the, in the world as well. So I see some change, but also I think there is more self-reflection, even in the superpower uh, country. Uh, and that's probably in the right direction. But going back to something, I'll just finish by one more uh, reminder that I think we have to think about not merely what should be done, but also why, even if we know what should be done, it doesn't get done. Nick, did you want to take the enforcement of commitments yes. in the call yes. process? Um, just a footnote to what was just said about uh, superpowers and the end of the 1980s. Remember that market fundamentalism kicked in a decade before the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall. And I think that looking back, uh, it kicked in politically. And I think subsequently, too many economists um, told politicians what they wanted to hear. And I think that it was a defect in our profession at that time. On the cops, um, uh, for my sins, I've been to all the cops since 2006 <laughs> and have been quite closely involved with some of the outcomes. Um, the, I don't think there's a, uh, a, a legal system from Mars that's going to uh, enforce uh, international agreements. Um, and we shouldn't look for it because I think that would be divisive. And one of the reasons we got Paris is that it was sort of a bottom-up sign-up story. What are you going to do? And then let's all agree where we need to go and let's recognize that what we've all agreed to do doesn't actually fit with where we need to go. So how do we work to bring the, them closer together? I don't think we'd have got agreement without that approach and I think it was a major step forward in uh, international uh, relations. And it's led, um, if you look now, about 30% of the emissions are now in areas where the clean is already cheaper than the dirty. Uh, that will be probably two thirds within 10 years. Um, and uh, it could go faster than that with good policies. How did that come about? Well, I think Paris and those agreements indicated a sense of direction. They, indicate, they indicated a sense of responsibility. And pretty soon, they brought us the idea of net zero. And uh, net zero is something that individuals can do, that communities, <coughs> cities can do, and firms can do. It was amazing that when the target was to reduce emissions by 80% 1990 to 2050, how many people thought they were in the 20% and didn't have to do anything. So I think the sense of direction has been important, the sense of responsibility and understanding the, how you make that, uh, translate that sense of responsibility into practicality through the idea of net zero. I think all that has been pretty powerful. Are we moving fast enough? Nowhere near fast enough. But there are ways and that we can intensify and that are really about how you make it happen based on those kinds of international agreements. I mean, Vince Cable here in, in, in the front row. I mean, the putting together of the climate change legislation in the UK and the sustaining that legislation across changes in government. I think 
was the kind of thing that, that uh, was very important in making progress. And in this, this case, you know, it came before Paris and it helped sort of lead to Paris. So these are processes, I think, which generate, as it were, uh, momentum and ideas and understandings and senses of responsibility which can, uh, which can lead somewhere. And you're also seeing courts of law now, country by country, and there's a, a lot of work on that here at the LSE, which is starting to uh, put responsibilities on governments and indeed companies in the sense of the Dutch uh, legal system and shell put pressure on them to conform. So it isn't a formal big stick enforcement mechanism, but it's created its own momentum, it's created some social enforcement, and in some cases it's created some legal enforcement. But are we going fast enough? Nowhere, nowhere near. Right, let me take another round of questions. Gentleman here, woman there. I can take one more if there's someone. So my question is sort of about how, how can we prevent climate policy becoming an elite uh, path, both within a, a particular country, for example, with the Yellow Vest protests in France, um, where sort of lower income groups felt like they were being targeted by climate policy by um, policymakers who didn't understand how it would affect them or didn't care. But also uh, sort of within the international community where developing countries sort of feel like they deserve a chance to become uh, as industrialized as developed countries, perhaps even using the methods that uh, the developed countries used, which were sort of fossil fuel based and Obviously, there's a lot of progress in making clean energy a, a cheaper option, even. But there's still some sense that um, developing countries are being wronged by being dragged along uh, when they weren't really given the chance to, to catch up first uh, economically. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Alexander Evans in the School of Public Policy. I guess one of the challenges of the Washington Consensus, as with all public policy, is it's more K Street than Main Street. Uh, you know, there's a sense that it's elite policy communities rather than uh, for ordinary people. And I just wonder what the panel's view is. Where does citizen choice and where does citizen voice sit in any new 21st century policy framework, whether it's a consensus one or not? Okay. Why don't we start with a citizen voice? And I was going to go to you, probably. Leonard, if you wanted to, and then Nick will take the elite issue. I personally think that's very important, citizen voice. Uh, I was talking about the voice of workers, the voice of the local community, uh, and that, the reason I brought it up is, uh, is that is generally ignored quite often when you talk about what should be the policy. Usually we think in terms of the central government. We ignore the local community, low participation of the local community. So that's precisely what at least the first two points that I met in my uh, initial presentation. By now, there's a great deal of experience in different countries on, on this matter. Some experience has failed, some, but many have succeeded at the, the local level. And I think it's important for us, and I've tried in a, in a, in a scattered way uh, to, uh, to look into it. So we now have enough experience of at the local community uh, voice is being expressed, not merely that, uh, some things have been done because of that voice, uh, but in some other cases it's failed. So it's very important for me uh, uh, to emphasize that we should study not the successful cases, also the failure cases, and to see why some failed, why not, is there a pattern? So I'll give you my own uh, personal research many, many years back. So I was looking into uh, water. Water is a major environmental resource. So I found in Indian villages, some villages, water gives rise to lots of conflicts in water distribution at the local community level. <coughs> so some villages resolve the water conflicts much better than other villages. And I was trying to understand that. And in fact, as an economist, I also collected data <coughs> and then statistically analyzed that. And we found out some factors come out. And just, I don't want to give you a description of my old paper, but one, one issue that came up is that it is easier to resolve conflicts when the local situation, the inequality is less. In the villages, 
when the underlying inequality, not just in economic terms, power and inequality is less, it was easier to, to come to a decision about resolving the conflicts. In villages, failure is not just because of inequality, but inequality was a major factor, at least in our statistical analysis. So I, I, I'm going to start by being philosophical here. So um, there is growing literature in political theory about public reason, which says that policies have to be public and be explained so that any reasonable individual will understand. It, so, and, 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 I, and I think um, expertise is important, political process is important, but be able to communicate expertise and policy in a way that ordinary people will understand, I think is super critical. You know, I'm so disappointed, for instance, with our political process. You know, look at election campaign, full of platitudes. You know, like, I get messages all the time from Democratic Party, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat, you know. But then some machine told them that I live in Ohio while I live in uh, New Jersey. And then all they tell me every now and then is that, okay, uh, the wall is going to fall, the world is okay, shipping $5, you know. So it's not about, you know, you are a political scientist at Princeton, can you organize a town hall meeting in Trenton to tell people why this works? Listen to people and think about what they need, what they want, and communicate with us. I will do it for free. I will pay to do it, not, not go for free, you know? But it doesn't work that way. So, and I think academics have to turn a little bit themselves into some kind of social entrepreneur in a sense, like, being able to take message, climate change, other things, and being able to find a way to get ordinary people to be smarter, to be more knowledgeable, because we cannot count on politicians to do it. You know? So I think this is very important. In my own research, for instance, something that works always is deliberation. You know, I did, I got politician, I, I randomized in Philippines and Benin, get politicians to do town hall meeting as opposed to big rallies. Town hall meeting, 10 times cheaper, more effective. Um, I did a project in the context of RISE in Nigeria, um, where, for instance, we organized education summits to design, communicate effectively about policy priority in education. I mean, like, not only the budget that the government put for is much higher, because there is transparency and clarity about priorities. And also individuals in the community were able to mobilize you know, so that any gap in spending was covered. So I, I completely agree with you, but it, it takes um, us to take political message, more serious, <coughs> be creative about design of institutions that help us I think if we can't rely on political process to do it, and I think academics has to be an important role. You know, I mean, I discovered recently, for instance, uh, movies and arts as a way to communicate complex uh, issues. You know, as you may know, my claim to fame this year was I was the historical advisor of the movie The Woman King uh, in Benin. And I mean, it's, a, it's about the female warriors of Benin. Whatever short story, short. Uh, it's like that message that come came out of the movie. It's far more powerful than any book I've ever written to convince people that there was a time where women could be in a position of power and influence. You know, so be able to build ties with the artists, and uh, in particular so that we can actually change people's belief, change social norms, and give people voice, as you said, I think it's something important. We have to get creative 
and imaginative in how to do these things better. Nick. Um, Inequality. Let me respond first through um, work in Africa and India and then say something about um, the richer, richer countries. Um, there isn't any high carbon growth story. It uh, destroys uh, the environment in a way that makes before long future growth uh, impossible. The growth story of the 21st century and the story of overcoming poverty in a sustainable and resilient way is through low carbon growth. And um, uh, as I've described in some of the examples I already gave, I, I won't go back over them. Uh, I work very closely with Prime Minister Mele Zanawe of uh, Ethiopia for many years, starting with the when I was Chief Economist of the World Bank in 2000, and then for a dozen or more years. And he was crystal clear. He was on the road to taking Ethiopia to a middle-income country uh, by the end of this decade and making it uh, close to zero carbon. I was on the same platform with him in uh, COP17 in Durban, two years after the difficulties of uh, Copenhagen, um, where I negotiated with him the 100, famous 100 billion, and he was crystal clear. He said, it, it is not justice to foul the planet because other people have fouled it in the past. That was Mellis's words, not mine. Uh, an outstanding leader for Africa and a voice that Africa has lost on the public uh, stage. But he wasn't just making the moral point. He was also pursuing a policy of green growth for uh, Ethiopia and making the most of uh, its assets, <coughs> bringing down infant mortality and really giving Ethiopia the best period of growth and development it's had. If you turn now to India, um, and let me give you a very micro example. Harish Hande, who founded uh, Selco uh, in Bangalore uh, a, a long time back now, um, has been bringing uh, micro solar and micro finance uh, first to Karnataka and then taking it across India. Um, the, in, in Bangladesh you've um, had similar kinds of movements where you know, the Gram Grameen Bank and, and the other big uh, NGOs in Bangladesh have been bringing uh, zero carbon um, energy to very poor people with great effect, often with very good gender effects as well, as we can, uh, as we can discuss. So you've got very powerful examples already moving um, in uh, Africa and in South Asia. Prime Minister Modi's speech in Glasgow uh, in November 21 set out a new model for growth in India. Nobody told Meles what to say. Nobody told uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi what to say. They thought and they looked and they worked it out. If you look at the new program for just energy transition in South Africa, it was put together in a very careful set of interactions where the actual the union movements were at uh, the centre of the discussions and they put forward a program for um, fundamental industrial change in a country which is really dominated by, uh, in many ways, by uh, coal. The, I've been very involved with the climate youth negotiators um, and they come from all over the world and they're an absolutely inspiring group of uh, young people and the big majority coming from the developing world. This is and should not be anybody telling anybody else what to do but we have to recognise how that changed understanding of development is really picking up pace. But, and there are big buts here, we do have to move um, resilience and adaptation closer to centre stage than uh, it has been. And we have to work hard on the cost of capital. Um, decentralised, sorry, solar, whether it's decentralised or not, is cheaper for electricity in most of Africa um, at cost of capital of 6-7%. It is not cheaper if the cost of capital is 15 or 20 
percent. So our challenge then is to work on bringing down that cost to capital, and it means managing risk, reducing risk, sharing risk in various ways. If that cost to capital is to be brought down, um, if you turn to richer countries, um, the poorer people buy second-hand cars, and there are not so many second-hand electric cars yet. Uh, it's okay for me to charge my electric car because I've got a drive and you know somewhere to put the charging thing. Um, that's not so easy if you're uh, if if you're not so uh, well off. So the cost, if you want to insulate your home, you've got to invest to do it, and the cost of capital for poorer people is higher than the cost of capital for richer people. So they're very clear directions of travel which are very attractive, actually particularly for poor people, but they become affordable only through public action, whether you're in, uh, in uh, Karnataka or uh, in Ethiopia or in uh, London or in, um, in Lyon or wherever you are. So the direction of travel is clear, the attraction is enormous, but it won't work without public policy, and it won't work without public policy that takes distribution very seriously. If I can add one sentence to that. I mean, obviously, we have to take distribution very seriously in, in introducing green policies, but if we don't introduce green policies, there are going to be very serious adverse distributional consequences too. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's the poorest people are hit earliest <clears throat> and hardest. Okay. Well, you know, I, I think, uh, Diane, you mentioned Gramsci, and... I'm feeling very grunchy at the moment. You know, the, old, the old has collapsed, but we don't know what the new is. But I think we know a lot about what the new isn't. And one, you know, one of the failures of the Washington Consensus was that I think economics is a discipline, probably worshipped at the altar of efficiency a bit too much, uh, and we we neglected distributional consequences and distribution. It didn't understand then, the meaning of efficiency very well, <laughs> Well, that's true, too. I will come to that. But I think one of the problems, and I'm not here, I'm not talking about redistribution, because I think that was the, that was the answer in the Washington Consensus, was you, you max out efficiency and then you do a bit of redistribution at the end, and we all know that that never happened. But to think about, you know, many of the failures, in, when we look at the failures of the Washington Consensus, fiscal consolidation, the fit, you know, what, the, the privatizations that went wrong, uh, the, the leveling up and regional distribution problems, the hollowing out of the middle class in many countries, a lot of that were distributional problems. We, we didn't pay attention to distribution. You know, I think, you know, when, when I was at the Bank of England and we did quantitative easing, we knew that it would affect asset prices and that would have distributional consequences. But we didn't do anything ex ante about those distributional consequences. And I think a lot of the failings are about the ex ante thinking around who wins and who loses from economic policies. And that is intensely political. I think, Nick, you reminded us the ideology of the Washington Consensus preceded the Washington Consensus, that it is ultimately about politics and values and how you measure success and all the things we've been talking about today. And I think in many ways we have a bit of a reckoning as, ec as economists to think about what are the politics and values that are underpinning what we're recommending. Because I, I think it is, it is an illusion to pretend that these, the Washington Consensus was not intensely political and full of implicit values. And whatever we think of as the alternative will also be intensely political and full of values. And we need to be aware of that as we shape whatever comes next in our post gramsci world. But I hope you'll join me in thanking the panel for challenging us to think about these big questions, for giving us excellent ideas uh, about what the future might hold. And thanks to all of you in our audience for uh, participating in this conversation which I hope will be the beginnings of many such conversations as we move to a better future. Thank you all very much.